So, um, so we looked at um, just the, the reactions that happened, and um, we, uh, from this, we found the, concept, the, the, the mass fractions uh, that you get after combustion, uh, given a certain composition uh, of the fresh mixture. Then we defined mixture fraction, and we found what the composition is as function of mixture fraction in the uh, so-called flame sheet model or the Burke schumann model. And then we looked at the first law of thermodynamics, and we um, got a, a relation that tells us what the flame temperature is. And then we said, now we're going to uh, look at the um, uh, chemical equilibrium. And yesterday we started talking about uh, what equilibrium means. We all um, uh, move towards equilibrium. Uh, chemical kinetics uh, systems, they move towards equilibrium. And the um, equilibrium then gives you, uh, what's nice about the, the, that, that limit, it's an exact limit, it's something that, that you would really see uh, in nature, after infinitely long time, uh, very often the chemical systems have a certain departure from, from that equilibrium, and that is controlled by kinetics. But it's still interesting to look at chemical equilibrium as a, uh, an approximation to what you see in a flame. Uh, for hydrogen diffusion flames, actually, that is a really good assumption. Equilibrium is, is not a bad assumption. For hydrocarbon diffusion flames, we see that for rich, for lean conditions, the equilibrium is a good uh, approximation. For rich conditions, typically it's not a good approximation because um, at rich conditions, the equilibrium has species that you would normally see or has a composition that uh, you would normally not see in a flame. So, uh, but, but for these conditions, the equilibrium can be used. So let's see how um, uh, the, the equilibrium is defined. We first introduce here the uh, partial molar entropy, uh, which we did before. We said the entropy is a function of temperature and pressure. And so um, we say the entropy here, the, the partial molar entropy, is a, uh, an entropy part that only depends on temperature and then a second part that uh, just has the pressure influence. And so this here is exactly or very similar to what we had for the enthalpy. There's a reference term plus a temperature dependent term. And then uh, we so we call this SI naught. And then we have, in addition to this, we have a pressure dependent term. And so um, the, um, these um, reference values, we, we saw we find these in a table. And then you see here, actually now we have uh, three uh, different uh, contributions here to the entropy. Now, we define the, the Gibbs 3 energy, uh, which is defined as H minus Ts. The, the Gibbs 3 energy, you can say, that, con that um, uh, corresponds to the part uh, of the energy that you can turn into work, into usable work. And, and that means if, if, if that usable work is, is all used up, I mean, if there's no more usable work, in the, uh, in the energy, then uh, we are at equilibrium. That's just like when I um, hold this um, laser pointer up, it has potential energy, you know, just like uh, a mixture might have chemical energy. And if I release it, then it goes towards equilibrium. The equilibrium for this, it just will drop on the floor. Uh, once it's on the floor, uh, the, the, the energy is all used up. Um, it, this thing still has energy, but the, the parts that I can convert into work, that is, still, uh, that is then used up. And, and so it's an equilibrium at the floor. And so uh, similarly for the, for the um, uh, chemical uh, energy, as soon as this um, uh, uh, Gibbs free energy reaches a minimum, uh, when it reaches a minimum, that's, that's uh, when you reach equilibrium. Minimum means uh, dg is equal to zero, so the change of, um, uh, of G is zero, or it means if I am at the equilibrium point and I, um, I uh, disturb the system a little bit by maybe changing the concentrations artificially, then uh, no matter what I do, the, 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 the Gibbs free energy will always increase. It, it cannot decrease any further. So that's, that's this condition here, dg is equal to zero. Um, G here is um, 
related or I can, I can compute uh, the, or calculate the, the G, the Gibbs free energy of the mixture uh, with the mole numbers and the uh, partial uh, Gibbs free energies of the individual species. Okay? Then, um, so, so this is the condition for equilibrium. So we look at uh, what is uh, G. G is a function of pressure, temperature, and the composition. And so we can write DG as uh, VDP minus STT plus, um, uh, plus uh, this mu I times DNI. Uh, we'll see what the, what the mu I is. So this, this is something, an equation that one can derive from the definition of G. And then we can also write the total differential uh, for G, which depends on PT and N. We can write it as the GDP dP, the GDT dT, and so on, plus the sum of, of, of this here. And then if you compare the coefficients here, uh, these coefficients now need to be the same. You, if you compare the coefficients, you see that this quantity here, which we call the um, uh, chemical potential, is equal to the G DNI at constant temperature, pressure, and uh, constant uh, mole numbers, except for, for this one that, that we are considering here. Okay, so it's a partial derivative, dg, dni, at everything else uh, being held constant. And if, if we look at the definition, g is equal to this sum, we can directly evaluate this, and we see that dg, dni, at everything else constant, is just a partial molar um, uh, Gibbs free energy, okay? So the chemical potential is, is nothing else than the, the partial molar uh, Gibbs free energy. And, and the Gibbs free energy, uh, you know, it, it is um, uh, H minus TS. Uh, we, we know how to compute H, we know how to compute S, which means we can now, uh, we, can, we can calculate uh, these values and, and, and with that also we can uh, calculate the equilibrium. So the mu i, so this is, this is the, the partial uh, molar Gibbs free energy, which is an H minus TS, and um, uh, which we can then, uh, so for, which we can write like this. So it's mu i naught plus this pressure dependent term and the mu i naught has the two parts here of the enthalpy. This from the end is the reference enthalpy, this is the, the thermal part of the enthalpy, and it has the two parts, uh, the two temperature dependent parts, let's say, of the entropy, this is the reference part, and then this is the temperature dependent part, okay? So, so it's actually, the, all this is, is quite trivial, but there are a lot of different terms, a lot of bookkeeping, so you just have to uh, remember that you have all these different contributions, okay? So, so this is why this, or this temperature dependent part here, we call it all uh, mu naught, and, and we just remember it has these four different contributions, okay? So that is being evaluated then at, at one atmosphere, and then this is the pressure dependent term. And then if we um, uh, look at this condition again, dg is equal to zero, uh, g is this sum here, and, uh, or this is actually dg, is this sum here, and if you look at um, mu times dni, we can write this as um, mu times dni times nu i divided by nu i, and then you see this here from the coupling function, we said this is the same for all species in the reaction, and so this is a constant actually, we can take this out of the, uh, of the sum, because it's a constant, uh, same for all species, and then this goes away. And the condition for chemical equilibrium is that um, here this, this weighted sum with the stoichiometric coefficients of the um, uh, chemical potential is equal to zero, okay? And now you see I can, I can, um, I can uh, plug this, this form here, I can plug this in here, and then I have, um, I have a condition for the, for the chemical equilibrium. So we do this, um, so this is chemical potential, uh, which is equal to this plus this, temperature dependent part plus pressure dependent part. I plug this in here, and then I group this such that I get this part here on one side, and, and this part here on the other side. Then um, I call this here, I call this 
the equilibrium constant, okay? So, so, so the equilibrium constant then is, um, well, is, def is defined by this. And then if I uh, write this here, then you see this here, this is equal to the equilibrium constant, okay? So this basically, when we look at this again, this here is just all the uh, temperature dependent part of the chemical potential, and this is the pressure dependent part. And what's nice about this, what's interesting about this, is that the, um, uh, this, this part here, it only depends on temperature. So this is just uh, thermodynamics, basically. If, if you know the temperature, um, because it is just this, um, uh, this sum here, and this, these mu i's, we can evaluate these, uh, you know, if you know the temperature for each species, we can evaluate the sum. So this here can be determined just but not as independent of the mixture, we, we can determine this just by knowing the uh, temperature, okay? Independent of the composition. And this, the left-hand side here then, that, that basically contains the composition because it has the partial pressure, okay? Note that this P naught here, that if we look back at where this came from, this came from this uh, pressure dependent part and the pressure dependent part the P naught was the reference pressure, okay, at which all the other stuff is computed. So for, for our particular case here, we said um, uh, this here is the chemical potential at one atmosphere, so that pressure P naught here, that is one atmosphere here in our case, okay? So, so that, that's very interesting because um, f then from knowing the temperature, I can say something about the composition. And an example is shown here. If you have a reaction A plus B is equal to C plus D, then again, I have K of um, T, which I can evaluate if I, know the t if I fix the temperature. Uh, that is then equal to, if we write this uh, pressure part here, if we write this out, this would be uh, PC times PD, divided by PA times PB, and all the P naughts here, they go away, okay? They just cancel out. And then uh, this, the, these partial pressures, then partial pressure ratios, they're the same as the um, uh, mole fraction ratios, okay? So this tells you, gives you a condition on this composition, okay? So uh, KP determines composition as function of temperature. And then the second example here, A plus B goes to C. You see this is not equimolar. If the reaction happens, you get less moles than you put in. And then you see the, the one of these P naughts, it remains here in this expression. And so um, uh, I can write this then as mole fractions times P naught divided by P. And you see then the equilibrium here it also depends on the, on the pressure. The, this ratio here depends on the temperature here from the left-hand side, but it also depends on the pressure here from, from this term, okay? Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's a nice relation. Um, we can also rewrite this a little bit, uh, and that's useful as we see later. So you see here, this has the partial pressures on the left-hand side. We can write the composition here also instead of partial pressures in terms of concentrations. Why concentration? Because um, reaction rates usually involve concentrations. So if I, if I um, replace the partial pressure by the concentration, you see I get an additional RT term here, and if the reaction is equimolar, that RT term goes away, but if it's not equimolar, then it, it remains here. So this is the sum over all uh, stoichiometric coefficients. And then um, the, um, you see that I can um, define here a new, a different equilibrium constant. This here is what we call Kp because based on partial pressures. This we call Kc because based on, on concentrations. And that is equal to Kp divided by Rt divided by P0 to this power. And for an equimolar uh, uh, reaction, this sum here is zero. And, and for, for others, uh, you know, it, uh, you, there's a term here that remains. So that Kc is very useful. Why? Because if I have a reaction here, A plus B goes to C plus D, then uh, this uh, Kc is just equal to 
CC times CD divided by CA times CB, okay? That's just a definition of, of the KC. But at the same time, I can also um, write here an equation, let's say, for the rate of change of, of the concentration of A. So concentration of A would be the, uh, the, the forward reaction. Um, actually, actually, this should be... Uh, there should be a prime here, let's say. Maybe it works also this way, but there should be a prime, and this should be negative, and this should be positive. I guess because this has, does not have a prime, it's the same again. But, but uh, anyways, it's the, the, this ratio is the, the difference between the forward reaction, which consumes A, and the reverse reaction, which produces A, okay? And, and um, if we say we want to look at this at equilibrium, then uh, the rate of change should be zero, and then uh, the forward rate should be equal to the reverse rate, and I can uh, solve this here for the ratio of the, of the forward rate coefficient and the reverse rate coefficient, and you see the forward divided by the reverse rate coefficient then is CC times CD divided by CA times CB, and that was exactly the definition of this um, equilibrium constant, okay? So there is a general relation here that the forward, uh, the forward rate coefficient divided by the reverse rate coefficient is equal to Kc. Interesting, because Kc I can evaluate without knowing the composition, okay? This only depends on temperature and maybe on the, uh, uh, maybe also, no, it only depends on temperature, right? Because Kc is Kp, which is only a temperature function, times uh, here P0 divided by RT, but the P0 is one atmosphere, so it's a constant, it's a constant value. So this, this relation here is typically used when you, uh, you know, when you want to evaluate the reverse rate coefficient. So in a chemical mechanism, only the forward rate coefficient is provided, and then from the equilibrium constant you can compute, and then from the forward rate, and the equilibrium constant, you can compute the reverse rate, okay? And, and that, that has to be done. Uh, you can imagine if you specify forward and reverse rate uh, uh, separately, then these might not be consistent with thermodynamics, with the equilibrium, okay? So, so that's very important that, that these are uh, consistent, and the, the, this ratio gives you the equilibrium constant. Okay, so that's a, so that's a very useful uh, relation. This here shows some equilibrium constants. Um, this is the equilibrium constant um, as function of here the inverse temperature for uh, three different um, uh, reactions here. And basically because uh, you see the equilibrium constant always has the, the products in the numerator, the, the reactants in the denominator, when this becomes large, it means the equilibrium shift, shifts towards the products. If it becomes small, like here, then the equilibrium shifts towards the reactants, okay? So, and you see that by changing the temperature, you can change the equilibrium uh, dramatically here by, by orders of magnitude. Here, see, it's 10 to the 10, 10 to the 20. Uh, that would be the ratio of the concentrations of these two. So, what you see then, at a typical temperature here of maybe uh, 2,000, uh, the, here the, the equilibrium constant for this reaction is about, um, you know, 10 to the 5, whatever. I mean, it's, it's very large. And 10 to the 5 here means that the ratio of water divided by concentration of uh, oxygen and H2 squared, that's 10 to the 5. So, so most of this, of the reaction at 2,000 Kelvin, most of, of the, the products, uh, most of the composition in equilibrium is water, and there's a little bit, but there's always a little bit of, of hydrogen and oxygen left, okay? So, um, and vice versa, uh, here for example, O2 plus N2 goes to 2NO. Uh, you see for at, um, at room temperature here, let's say this is 1,000 Kelvin, uh, go down here maybe even more, and you see the ratio is 10 to the minus 10. That is very good. Why is this very good? It means that here in the atmosphere, 
there is an equilibrium. So we have a lot of O2 and we have a lot of N2, okay? And this soup has been sitting around here for millions of years. Uh, so it might be close to equilibrium, which means that if the, so which means that, that the ratio of NO divided by N2 times O2 is 10 to the minus 10. So this is mostly O2 and N2 and very little NO, okay? If this was the opposite, if this line, if this line would go like this, we wouldn't be talking about this, right? <laughs> because then everything here would be NO. There would be no oxygen, no N2, okay? So, so that, uh, that's, very, uh, that's very interesting. Now, another thing that's very interesting is you can think of chemical reactions as chemical reactions are always going towards this line, okay? Chemical reactions always try to bring a system towards this line. So these lines are an attractor for, for chemical reactions. And if you want uh, to convert, uh, let's say, um, you know, oxygen and the fuel to products, you have to make sure that, that you are in a regime here that, that gives you these products, okay? So, um, uh, for example, uh, you see here that, that this, this reaction 7, if you approach here 2,500 Kelvin, whatever, uh, 2,000, maybe, maybe you approach here 3,000 Kelvin, then, then this here is order 1, the, the equilibrium constant, and then you have a lot of NO, okay? So if you want to convert NO back to N2 and O2, you have to be at low temperature. Okay, to make to make the attractor uh, to make the attractor be here. Okay, so um, so so that shows you how to do this, how to calculate uh, the the equilibrium constants, and that's very nice in your com in a computer in a um, in a, a code like Kempkin or um, here our code FlameMaster. This is exactly what's being done. We have the um, these NASA polynomials, we have all these coefficients. From these, we can calculate all the, the entropies and the enthalpies uh, pretty accurately, and then, you know, we can do all of this. But, but that's, that's good for a computer, but sometimes you just want to draw a line like this quickly, and um, uh, it's good to have maybe an approximation. So, so this shows you how to make an approximation to compute equilibrium uh, constants. Um, which you can do very quickly then on a, on a, with these tables I showed you earlier uh, that you can do very quickly on a piece of uh, paper with a pencil, pencil and paper. So this is the this equilibrium constant uh, is defined like this, exponential function minus, and then here we have this temperature dependent part of the uh, chemical equilibrium, uh, of the uh, chemical potential. This had four different contributions, enthalpy reference, uh, entropy reference, uh, enthalpy uh, temperature dependent part and the entropy temperature dependent part. And if I plug this in here, then you see I get four different exponential functions. And now we can see, um, you know, what, how these look like. Uh, you see this here is minus a constant divided by RT. So, so, you know, we just leave this there. This here, here, and this term here actually, um, the uh, temperature uh, goes away, okay, and, and you see this is just a constant. This part here now is a little more tricky. Um, let's assume the temperature is relatively high compared to the reference temperature. Then you see that this second part here is small compared to the first, and then the temperature also goes away. So I can say for high temperature, this is almost constant, okay? That's, the, uh, that's basically the trick now. And then this here, uh, let's say we assume that um, uh, we assume that CP is constant. Then this is CP times ln T divided by T ref, and you see this is n times ln T, and so I can write this as um, n times ln T. And so if I do this now, this here is this this sum here is nothing else than the heat of reaction, um, which we know how to compute. Uh, this one here is now just this exponential function of a constant, so this is just a constant. And then this here is exponential of n times ln t, 
And that's nothing else than, so I can write n times ln t, I can write this as ln t to the nth power, okay? And then exponential of ln would be just t to the n. Okay, so, so you see, this looks pretty much like an Arrhenius expression. This is a constant times t to the nth power times exponential minus something divided by rt, okay? And this here, we know how to, um, how to evaluate. This here only depends on the species. So I can actually get this from the tabulated values, um, or I can tabulate this whole thing, actually. I call this pi a, and then um, this coefficient here, I can also uh, tabulate. It only depends on the species. I can tabulate it, and I call this pi b, okay? So, so we have this b. We can evaluate like this, um, n like this, and delta h. We know how to do this anyways. And then kp is just this Arrhenius-type expression. All I need to know for this is the pi values, pi a and pi b, for each species. And these are tabulated, or given here in this table. So you see for each species here, I have pi a and pi b. And then I can just plug these things in. And very easily, uh, with a uh, calculator, I mean, with, a, with your phone or whatever, you, you can compute uh, equilibrium uh, concentrations. So. So you see this, uh, the next few slides are just this table for, you know, all possible species that allow you to do this then. And then there's an example here that shows you uh, how to do this for, um, for N2 uh, plus O2 goes to 2 NO. Um, what's interesting is that the equilibrium really gives you only one condition, but you have three species. So the second condition comes from element conservation. So that gives you uh, two conditions, two equations, and then the third is just that the sum of all uh, mole fractions should be one, and so you have three uh, equations for three unknowns. And that's, that's shown here how to do this, and then we just go to the uh, result here. And so the result here then is given by this, um, by this expression. So this is the uh, concentration of an, or the, the mole fraction of NO um, as function here of the temperature. And we can evaluate this here for different temperatures. And you see at 300 Kelvin, the NO, uh, uh, the NO uh, mole fraction here is, is um, something uh, times 10 to the minus 16, okay? That, again, that's very good. Uh, but otherwise, we wouldn't be here. But if I go to high temperature, then you see the equilibrium. It changed very strongly at 1500 Kelvin here. Um, I get something like, um, uh, you know, 1 ppm. Uh, or, or 10 to the minus 3. So that's already, that's already a lot. Um, this here shows then the equilibrium line as function of temperature, and it kind of shows you what happens in an, in an internal combustion engine. Uh, internal combustion engine, you burn first at very high temperature, so you see the concentration here, uh, the, the mole fraction is 10, to the, is 10 to the 4 at high temperature, meaning, um, so it's 10 to the 4, PPM, that's, that's a lot, 10,000 PPM. And that's, so that's the attractor. So the NO um, uh, formation is not infinitely fast. So in the engine, then depending on the residence time, you will start forming NO. And if you have a bad diesel engine, typically you end up with something like 1,000 or 2,000 uh, PPM. You don't quite reach the 10,000. But then when the temperature goes down, then, and you, so you never really reach the equilibrium. Then during expansion, the temperature goes down and you are somewhere here. Now you have a lot of NO and the attractor would actually be down here with no NO uh, or 10 to the minus 16 whatsoever. But because the temperature is low now, the, the reaction is frozen. So it doesn't do anything, okay? So, so the, the, that reduction cannot happen. That's why, and then in a three-way catalyst, you have, a, uh, you have a, a, a catalyst that accelerates. So what, the, what does a catalyst do? It accelerates a reaction at low temperature, okay? So the catalyst then accelerates the reaction and then uh, it, it approaches again the attractor here, the equilibrium, uh, which is at very low concentration. So what would happen if you used the catalyst at high temperature? 
At high temperature, a three-way catalyst would not reduce NO, but it would form even more, okay? Because it always goes towards equilibrium. And at high temperature, equilibrium value is very high. Low temperature, the equilibrium value is very low, okay? So the, 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 the catalytic reaction has to be at low temperature, okay? Otherwise, you wouldn't reduce uh, NO really. Okay, so, so that's uh, just an example. There's a second example here for hydrogen plus oxygen uh, reaction. Um, that, that also requires the, um, uh, the, the element mass fraction, so it's a little complicated. Um, so we won't go through the details here, but, but the, the result of this reaction is shown here. And um, the reason why we want to look at this reaction, because we said earlier, there's a difference between an equimolar reaction and, and a reaction that's not equimolar. So this is not an equimolar reaction. You have three moles on the left side and only two moles on the right-hand side. And now you see that this reaction, first of all, when we change, um, when we change the, the um, temperature, then you see you increase uh, here the, it, for high temperature, you increase or you shift the equilibrium towards the, towards the reactants. At low temperature, you shift the, rea the, the, the reaction towards the products, okay? And then secondly, what you see, when you go from low pressure to high pressure, so compare 2,000 at one bar to 2,000 at 10 bar, then you decrease, so then you shift. So if you go to high pressure, you shift the, um, uh, the reaction to the reactants also. Okay, so um, uh, actually you should shift it to the products, right? You shift it to the products, exactly, yeah. So at high pressure, you shift this to the products, okay? So this is, this is what this says here. So why is that? Um, we can look at the equation, and the equation shows that um, actually you see in the equation, first of all, the temperature effect. Um, you, this was the equilibrium constant. Um, if you have an exothermic reaction, that's the, that's the point that controls the temperature dependence. If you have an exothermic reaction, meaning delta H is negative, then dKdt is also negative, which means that um, you shift the, for higher temperature, you, sh you shift the, um, uh, the equilibrium towards the reactants. And if you look at the pressure dependence, um, we see that for, for equimolar reaction, this, this, um, uh, 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 the P0 term goes away. But if, if it's not an equimolar reaction, then there is a pressure dependence um, be because of this. And, and this means that um, you, you also shift the uh, equilibrium due to the pressure. And the, the way you can think about it is that um, the equilibrium always tries to counteract the effect, okay? So, so if you increase the, uh, so if you have an exothermic reaction, the exothermic reaction tries to make the, the temperature higher. And so the, if the temperature gets higher, then the, then the equilibrium tries to counteract this by running the reaction reverse from the products to the reactants, which lowers the temperature, okay? So same for the pressure. If you hear this, if you have this reaction and you increase the pressure, then the, um, if you increase the pressure, then what the equilibrium uh, tries to convert more reactants to products which then lowers the pressure again, okay? So that's the, called here this Litter Chatelier's principle that the equilibrium also tries to counteract uh, the effect of the, of the reaction. Okay, so that, that is very useful because it shows you, um, uh, it, it explains some of these, um, uh, it, it immediately uh, explains some of the, the trends we saw earlier for different reactions uh, what, what slope they have uh, as function of temperature and so on. Okay, any questions about this? When, way back when, um, when you were summing, when you were, um, yeah, uh, defining the equilibrium constant, uh, you had nu sub i l. What is the l tabulated? 
Oh, that's the reaction. That's the okay, so this uh, this holds for each. You have different coupled reactions. Yeah. So okay. so so this holds for each single reaction. Okay. And so that was the index L was was just it means this this has to be the case for all possible reactions. And here we're always just looking at one single reaction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then uh, I think this was the last slide. So then um, let me check. Uh, right. Okay, so then um, for, the, for the video, we're going to the next lecture. Um, and that would be, well, let me just say, the, in the handouts, uh, you, the next lecture would be lecture three. And this is um, fluid dynamics and balance equations. So that just summarizes the governing equations. Um, here, for the purpose of this class, I assume you know the equations. Uh, momentum equation we don't actually use very much. Uh, temperature equation is the, and, and mass fraction equation is what we mostly use. And so if you, um, if you, uh, you know, are not familiar with how the temperature equation, for example, looks like, then you should, um, that's, that would be your evening homework for tonight uh, to look at this. But here we'll, we'll skip this and go to, uh, this would be lecture four then. And uh, this is the title here. Um, Laminar premix flames and uh, kinematics of the uh, burning velocity. And so what we want to do here is we, I'll uh, say a few words about premix flames. I'll show you the burner um, already last time. Maybe, maybe um, we'll look at it again uh, in, uh, when, when we talk about this. And then we talk about the kinematics uh, of flames. Uh, we define this quantity, laminar burning velocity, then we define a field equation that describes a flame front position. And then we talk about uh, different aspects here of um, flame, uh, of the influence of stretch and curvature on flame propagation, and also uh, two instabilities uh, that, that, you, that you find in premixed flames. One is called the thermodiffusive instability, and one is the hydrodynamic instability. So uh, premixed flames are, are are used, um, are always used in, in combustion devices when you want to get high heat release rates. I showed you last time how the, um, the premix flames has a much higher power density uh, than, than the diffusion flame, which just takes a lot more space. Um, the other thing that is really interesting about um, premix flames is that um, uh, because of the small volume, the residence times also can be low, can be very low, which is good for NOx formation. I said earlier, uh, you know, NOx formation is very slow. And so if you have short residence times, uh, you will, you will um, uh, keep NOx concentrations low. But then also um, what's very interesting is that uh, uh, premixed flames you can actually choose the equivalence ratio. In a, in a non premix flames, you always have all equivalence ratios because you have pure air on one side maybe and pure fuel on the other side and you have every single equivalence ratio or mixture fraction in between, okay? So you can't choose that. For a premix flame, you can choose that and you can either burn um, a stoichiometric or lean or rich, whatever you want, okay? Why is that good? Uh, you probably know that NOx formation, thermal NOx formation, depends very strongly exponentially on the temperature, which means I increase the temperature by just a little bit and I get twice, uh, twice the concentration of NO, okay? So um, if, you, um, if you burn lean, so because the adiabatic flame temperature is a function of equivalence ratio, as we saw yesterday, I can either go rich or lean and that will decrease the flame temperature and it will reduce NOx, okay? So that is one of the main reasons why we use non premix, uh, why we use premix combustion is because you can go rich or lean to reduce NOx. So which one would you do? Would you go rich or lean if you wanted to reduce NOx? Lean, why lean? Because if we burn rich, then half the fuel comes out of the engine and that's uh, not desired because the fuel you pay for. The air is always for free, okay? So if there's a lot of air coming out of the, of the combustor, then uh, you, you might have paid something to heat up the air, so there's always some, 
some excess heat coming out, but, but it's cheaper than the fuel is always expensive, okay? Um, and then also, of course, that's one reason. The second reason is that the fuel comes out not as fuel, it comes out as usually as um, half oxidized intermediates, let's say, which would be CO and H2. We'll see later on why you get CO and H2. But um, so CO, of course, is a, is a pollutant, is harmful, you don't want that. And then also you form uh, particulates, you form soot under rich conditions, uh, which is also not good. So it's an easy choice. Uh, you want to go lean. So lean premix combustion is what, what people typically use in, uh, in engines, let's say in a gas turbine. This is a simulation we did for, for a gas turbine. And um, this uh, red here is the flame, is a turbulent flame. We'll talk about turbulent combustion uh, later on. But, but, um, but, but that's, that's what people typically use. And then the problem is that if you go too lean, then you might get, um, hydro, uh, you might, might get uh, thermoacoustic instabilities, okay? So, so uh, the reason really being that at, at very lean conditions, the burning velocity, which we'll define later on, it depends very strongly on equivalence ratio. So if, the, if you have local fluctuations of equivalence ratio, then, then the flame has a lot of dynamics because it gets slower, faster, slower, faster. Um, and then that sends out pressure waves. And these pressure waves, they influence again uh, your injection system. So the pressure waves, they influence the injection system, and they lead to more local fluctuations of equivalence ratio, which leads to more pressure waves and so on. So you can get from this a nonlinear feedback. Those of you who take Professor Leuven's uh, class in the afternoon, uh, you, you will hear all about, uh, all about this. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's the issue. Uh, instabilities, uh, these uh, thermoacoustic instabilities are a big issue. Thermoacoustic instabilities are very different from, from the instabilities that we will talk about later on. Uh, the, the difference is uh, thermoacoustic instabilities really are a feedback between pressure waves and, and, you know, all of this. I mean, it's really a feedback loop. And the um, instabilities we will talk about, they are intrinsic. If they happen, there's no feed, they just, they just happen. Um, they don't interact with the full system. So, um, so examples here for where premix combustion is being used. Uh, is used in stationary uh, gas turbines. Stationary gas turbines, they can operate at a single condition, let's say. Uh, so you can try to operate very close to the stability limit. You're very lean, you get low emissions, um, everything is good. In aircraft engines, you don't want this because they have to be very dynamic. It's very hard to control instabilities uh, in a dynamic environment and, and in an engine. Uh, in an aircraft engine, you don't want any failure, don't want any instabilities. You just want it to burn uh, uh, very stably, which is why aircraft engines have more emissions than, than stationary gas turbines. And um, at the same time, uh, research now tries to make uh, aircraft engines more premixed to, to uh, reduce emissions, um, uh, of course, uh, not at the cost of stability. So this, I said, advantage, lean premix combustion, smoke-free, low NOx, and so on. Uh, but but uh, premix combustion, always you have the danger of explosion. This is another big, uh, big point. Uh, imagine that you have a, um, you know, like uh, now you have these uh, big boilers um, that, um, you know, uh, heat up water in, in, uh, in power plants, okay? Now, imagine you have um, uh, fuel, and air coming in uh, in a premix way, imagine the flame goes out or it doesn't burn right, then you fill up a huge volume uh, with, a, with a combustible fuel air mixture, uh, which of course you can imagine, now you have a spark and the whole thing blows up. So anytime you have large systems, uh, people stay away from premix combustion because, because it, um, uh, large volumes can, can uh, that, that can be very dangerous. So, so uh, large systems are usually non-premix because it's much safer, much more stable, and so on. So if you look at, um, at this here, this is a picture uh, I stole from uh, Godfrey Mungel here, probably done together with Professor Hansen, who teaches the course now at the same time. Uh, this is an image that shows the reaction zone of a premixed Bunsen flame, a laminar Bunsen flame. And then also uh, it shows these... Um, 
particles that go through the flame and it shows the pathways of these particles. And see the particles, they come up uh, straight, they're almost parallel here, and then they're deflected uh, when they go through the flame. So the first thing you see, that's what I mentioned last time, uh, flames are very thin, they're, they're really very thin. And then the second thing uh, you see here is, uh, is deflection of the streamlines, except for this one streamline that, that goes uh, along the center line. So why are the streamlines uh, deflected by the flame? Because it's expanded. Yeah, because you have uh, the heat release, the temperature goes up, which means the density goes down. Now all of a sudden you have more volume, you have a higher volumetric flow, and then, um, and then uh, it, it can't go straight anymore, it goes, uh, it goes to the side. So this is what, uh, this, is what this does. So uh, in premix flames, you, you typically see this bluish color. I mentioned this last time. These are uh, this by chemiluminescence uh, of excited radicals here, for example, C2, which is a little more greenish, and, and CH, uh, which is more this, this um, uh, which I think is also a little more greenish, and OH, which is more the, the light blue. Uh, this is a turbulent premix flame, or this is a time average picture of the turbulent premix flame. The laminar flame. Then also you have something you see more of a reddish color. The reddish color comes from uh, water, basically. So you see this in the in the combustion products. Uh, whereas uh, diffusion flames, of course, they are uh, they they yellow because. So you also see a reaction zone here in blue in, in diffusion flames, but then the yellow because you have very rich regions which form uh, soot, uh, uh, typically uh, for for most fuels. Okay, so then we can look at the flame structure. How does this flame look like? You have on one side of the flame, on the unburned side, you have a fuel-air mixture. So, that's, so this here shows now, um, let's say, the, the, the mass fractions and the temperature along a line that crosses the flame here like this, okay? So this here is the unburned side. This is where the fuel-air mixture comes in. And this here is the burned side. And so this here is mass fraction is function of x here, which is the length along this arrow. And so here on the, uh, on the, on the left-hand side, you have a fuel-air mixture, and the fuel uh, just flows into the flame, okay? So um, the temperature is low. That's what I said last time. It's cold in here. Uh, you can stick your finger in there, but, um, but uh, be, be careful that you don't get burned by the reaction zone. But in here, it's, it's actually cold. So if, if you go closer then to the flame, then uh, you see that the temperature here starts to increase and the um, fuel and, and oxygen, they start to decrease until they reach the reaction zone here. In the reaction zone, um, the temperature here reaches this, um, uh, this uh, value Ti. We will call this later um, the inner layer temperature. Uh, this is the temperature where reactions start. Uh, below these temperatures, there are no chemical reactions. So this means all of this uh, that's left here of the shaded area, all of this is chemically inert. It's just transport. It's diffusion and convection. And so uh, here, this is then the point where chemistry starts, and that converts then, that um, consumes fuel and air. Uh, you see here, this is the reaction rate which is only non-zero here in the reaction zone, uh, converts fuel and air to products. And then, so this is product mass fraction, let's say. And um, the temperature then reaches uh, in, this, in this reaction zone, reaches the, let's say, the adiabatic flame temperature, okay? So this is here for a lean system. For a lean system, the fuel is all consumed. And some oxygen remains, and that is just, you know, comes out of the flame. So, uh, so that's how, that's how uh, this looks like. The question then is, so why does, the f why does fuel and air go down here uh, if it's not consumed, if chemistry is zero? Well, um, you know, this is easy if you understand the transport mechanisms. Imagine that you consume all the fuel at this point then the concentration has to be zero. And, but, but, but the reaction rate is, is only non-zero here at this point because you consume all the fuel at this point. And then here, uh, this is the fresh mixture, the, the fuel mass fraction must be large. 
And so from here to here then, or from here to here, it's just a diffusion profile. You just have a flux. This just says you have a flux that goes from here, a diffusive flux that goes from here into the reaction zone, where then the fuel is uh, consumed again. So this here is just uh, diffuse, diffusion convection, and this is the, this is the uh, uh, reactions happen then here in the reaction zone. So um, the uh, premix flame then you can say is the interaction of uh, diffusion and uh, chemistry because the, the fuel, first of all, it comes in here into the flame by diffusion and then it's, it's, it's burned by chemistry. And these two, um, these two processes, they have to be coupled because, of course, you cannot, you cannot convert more by chemistry than the diffusive flux you bring in. Uh, sorry, YP, that's the product, yeah. Okay, so if there's no reaction to break this zone, why is this bubble going in the top? Yeah, same thing. If, let's say here it's all zero, and let's say here I just fix it at this value YP, then diffusion just makes it spread into the preheat region. Right? It's just diffusion, okay? So, so diffusion, um, so that's also the, the beauty of this. This is how they are connected. I mean, in a sense, you can say uh, this temperature here, this is where chemistry starts. But um, so, and then the chemistry just converts the temperature from Ti to Tb, okay? But you have to reach Ti first. I mean, otherwise, chemistry doesn't happen. And how do you reach Ti? Because here the temperature is high, and this is just heat conduction. Heat conduction will have a, will cause a, a heat flux into the unburned gases. This is why we call this, so you preheat the unburned gases by heat flux up to this TI, and then you, you, um, it's converted by chemistry. This is why we call this um, region here, we call it the preheat zone, because, uh, because uh, fuel and air are preheated. But they're only preheated because I have a high temperature here in the burnt gases. Okay, so, so that's what happens. We can now look at the uh, kinematics of this flame, uh, first of all, before we look more in the structure. This is the Bunsen burner I showed you last time. Um, you, we have uh, here slots for, for air. Uh, if I close these, I get a diffusion flame. I open these. Air comes in here. It, it mixes. You get a fuel air mixture. I can't control really the equivalence ratio here, but, um, uh, oh, yes, I can. I can make these uh, half... Um, close these half or, or, or have them fully open. Uh, I showed this last time that you get a partially premixed flame. And then um, the, the um, uh, fuel-air mixture comes out here, and then it burns in this, in this Bunsen cone. And the streamlines here, we saw this, they go like this. Okay, so that's the Bunsen burner. We can now look at the kinematics of this flame. If you look at this flame, this here is half this flame, and we assume it's a perfect cone, then we saw that um, the velocity coming in here is like this. And I can uh, split this up, this velocity coming in. I can split this up in a tangential part that goes tangentially to the flame and one that goes normally to the flame. Okay, so, so I have a velocity component that goes normal to the flame and in steady st So that velocity would actually push the flame out, okay? Convectively, it would push the flame away but the flame burns towards the unburnt mixture, and it burns in a way that the burning velocity, the velocity at which this front propagates, is exactly, um, uh, and exactly equal to the normal velocity component coming in, okay? So if, I, if you see this gray line, you see it propagates this way by burning, uh, with a laminar burning velocity, and then the velocity pushes it, pushes it out this way, and if these are equal, have opposite sign, then uh, you get a stationary uh, case, okay? So, so that's the normal velocity here, and you see immediately that if a flame burns with a constant, um, with a, with a constant burning velocity, and I make this burning velocity um, faster, then it will be faster than this, it will propagate inwards, and by doing this, the angle will change until the normal component will be 
by changing the angle, I increase the normal component and it will propagate inwards until these are exactly equal again, okay? So depending on the burning velocity, I get a different angle. If the burning velocity gets small or it gets zero, then the flame is almost, would almost look like this. It's almost parallel then uh, to the streamlines. Okay, so, uh, the, the so that's the normal component coming in. The normal component, of course, is then increased uh, through the flame because of the expansion. So I have a mass flux coming in here and I have the same mass flux coming out on the other side. Um, on this side, I have high density. On this side, I have low density. So the density goes down, the velocity has to go up, okay? So we have the same mass flux, which means uh, this accelerates. The tangential component of the velocity doesn't change. And then you see if I put the, the burnt velocity normal component and tangential component, I put these together again, I see how the streamlines are deflected, okay? So uh, that defines the burning velocity. This just says what I just said. And then you see also that from the angle here, I can actually compute uh, the burning velocity. So this angle is the same as this angle. And the normal, the, the, uh, the, the velocity coming in here, uh, that's, that's given here by the mass flow rate of the burner. Uh, let's say I know this, I know the, the volumetric flow rate, I can measure that. Then I know this velocity coming in, Vu. And then by this angle, um, I can compute the normal component and the normal component is the same as the burning velocity. So the burning velocity then is the uh, incoming velocity times the sine of this angle, okay? So that's a way to measure burning velocity for, for different fuels. You just have a, a burner like this and uh, you measure the angle and that, that gives you a good idea about the burning velocity. It's not, it's not very accurate which is why nobody would ever use or people have used this. Uh, maybe people still use it under severe conditions. But um, because you see here, you have uh, heat losses to the, to the burner maybe. Uh, typically, this is not um, plug flow condition. Typically, maybe you have a laminar flow, so you get a per se flow, velocity profile, and so on. So there, there are many challenges um, doing this, but in theory, you could imagine uh, you would do this this way. This here is what I just said, the mass balance through the flame front. Uh, the mass going in would be rho times Vn, uh, the normal component in the unburned. The mass going out of the flame is rho times Vn in the burnt, uh, which means the burnt gas velocity normal component is the unburnt times the density ratio. Density ratio for methane flame is maybe seven, which means you get a strong acce acceleration through the flame. Okay, so, um, so, so there's um, one more thing that's interesting is the tip here of this flame because the tip of this flame, um, there is no tangential component. The, the velocity goes straight through, which means that the velocity, the burning velocity at this point of this flame, it must be equal to the incoming velocity. Okay, that's, that's what it means. Uh, in a stationary case. Uh, and, and that is the case, and that is because of the curvature. So the curvature here, you see, you have um, this side of the flame preheating the gas here, and you have this side of the gas preheating this flame here. And um, uh, so, so this here is more preheated, uh, which, which is why the velocity here, the burning velocity here is a little higher. That depends also on the Lewis number um, for, uh, let's say, uh, lean methane flames, this is what you would get. For lean hydrogen flames, uh, you know, the opposite would be the case, and it would be slower at that point, which is why lean hydrogen flames, the, the tip of a Bunsen f uh, burner would be open, okay? So, um, so the curvature effect is something that we'll uh, talk about uh, a little more in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, Let's see, how are we doing in time? Are we over time now? Um, yeah, okay, so I think it's, uh, is it time to have a break? Yeah, so it's time to have a break, so let's continue in 15 minutes then.